Hello everyone, Alistair Gold here. It's that time of the week, the Tottenham Hotspur Q&A. Um, got 25 questions today. Um, what I do, we do get lots and lots and lots in. We don't just get uh, 20, which I often do, or 25 today. Uh, but what I try to do is try and not do ones that I've answered a few times before because I know that any regular viewers are probably thinking, oh God, he's not going on about that again. Um, and obviously sometimes people ask similar questions. So if your question doesn't make it in, it's only because someone got in there first with a similar question or I managed to completely miss your question. Uh, and if I did, just let me know and I'll try and get it on another one. So let's get cracking straight into this because I've got to fly through these because um, 25, you know how I like to waffle. So if I go on too long on one, we're going <laughs> to run out of time for the ones at the end. So Thomas Watson gets the ball rolling with, what's your opinion on Marcus Edwards? Can he still make it to the top? And could you see him back at Spurs? Um, people probably know my opinion on Marcus Edwards if they've ever read my stuff. Um, he's probably one of the most gifted dribblers of a ball I've seen at Spurs in many, many years. Um, very... Uh, very good shooter, shooter of the ball, striker of the ball, um, great set pieces, very talented young man. Um, what is he, 20, 21 now? Um, but obviously, we know the well-documented issues uh, of why he didn't quite make it at Tottenham. And I think that's one of, certainly Mauricio Pochettino's big regrets was that he, he couldn't quite make that situation work for Marcus because he's got all the talent in the world. He just needs the rest of his game to kind of balance out with it. Um, you know, I mean, I don't want to go too much into Marcus because, you know, I think very much it's it's now about looking to the future with him. And he's at Vittoria in Portugal and he's doing really, really well. Um, he seems to, as with a lot of young players, and I think he admitted it himself, it's about maturing. It's about getting past certain ways of behaving when you're a young guy. You know, we've all done it um, and just kind of, you know, these top, top players in the world, you know, the Ronaldos, uh, the Messis, uh, Harry Kane, they get there because of the utter professionalism and drive and work ethic. That's why they're there, allied with their talent. And if you only have got work ethic or you've only got talent, then you're probably not going to go all the way. But if you've got both, you know, you can be a superstar. And I think with Marcus, it's now about just continuing to knuckle down and keep on this path. Um, he's at Vittoria. I, I do I do believe he'll probably come back into a major league. And that's not to do down the Portuguese league because it produces lots of great players. But I don't think it's really considered to be a major, you know, one of the top, top European leagues right now. But I think he'll come back. I, I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up somewhere like Germany, perhaps. Um, I know, you know, Keenan Bennett's went out there. Jaden Sancho, I think he's, um, he's friends with as well. That's obviously a path pathway for young players now is to head over to the Bundesliga. And I wouldn't be surprised to see him there. He's had experience of the Netherlands, now Portugal. Um, Spurs have got, I'm pretty sure it's a 50% sell-on clause. So they're going to get some good money. Can I see him back at Spurs? Probably not, I'd imagine. Um, I think that's just part of his past um, and probably not going to be part of his future. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answers that. Norman Roberts asks... Do you think we'll sign a right back and a backup for Harry Kane or someone to compete with him? And who will they be? Oof, answers on a postcode, uh, postcard, really, isn't it, for those uh, right now? This is the thing with this transfer window, more than any other before, pretty much all bets are off. You know, players that have been on club scouting lists for a long time now may suddenly be out of reach or teams may not want to sell because the market has dropped. So suddenly they may want to... I think there's going to be a lot more stable squads. You know, I, I, I could give you names that Spurs have obviously looked at. You know, we know they've looked at Max Ahrens from Norwich extensively, a uh, player they really wanted. If Norwich go down, what's his price tag going to be like? Is it going to be achievable? Uh, with Spurs, you know, I hate to harp on about this, but all clubs, they just transfer kitties or budgets, whatever you want to call them, war chests have absolutely fallen up, fallen out the bottom, essentially. Um you know, they're just trying to concentrate on being able to keep afloat, um, let alone kind of sign players. And I know that's not what people want to see. I saw on Twitter this whole thing going on about people still expecting uh, big signings and Joe Lewis to pump in money and stuff like that. You know, 20 years of not doing that. Um, I can't see that happening in the 20th year as like a special anniversary gift. Um, and every kind of sound that's coming out from the club doesn't sound like there's going to be big spending this summer either. So... 
Yeah, I think you're just going to have to revise those targets. You know, Thomas Mounier obviously is a free agent. Um, he's going to be one that a lot of teams are going to look at, the PSG right back. And up front, I think you're then looking at players in the last years of their contracts, like Olivier Giroud now, he's had that option taken up on his contract. Um, Josh King is another one that Spurs have looked at in the past. Bournemouth, uh, Norway international. Really good player, can play out wide as well. I think those are the kind of players Spurs are going to be looking at. You know, it's not, as I always use the expression, sexy transfers. It's not these 60, 70, 80 million, 90 million, you know, like Kai Havertz. I saw Spurs linked with him the other day. It's like, come on. It's, it's, it's brilliant. We'd all love it. You know, we all play FIFA and Football Manager and all of that. We'd love to have our team grabbing those players. But I think Ondembele deal was very much... Uh, the last kind of its kind we're going to see, I'd imagine, for a little while, while clubs try to stabilise their finances. Um, Mark Shaz asked, do you think it's wise, English football, going back this season? Is it worth taking a risk with players' health? Um, I'd probably say the kind of decision rests with the players, really. Um, as we've seen, you know, some players haven't have decided not to come back as of yet. Uh, some may not come back. I think pretty much it, it's it's kind of the player's choice, uh, and I think that's been very clear. What I would say is, if English football doesn't come back, it's probably likely to be one of the only ones now. Um, you know, Germany obviously is already back. Spain's coming back. Italy's coming back. France, they're trying to re see if they can reverse a decision to actually the government wasn't it that decided to end their leagues rather than Ligue 1. So I don't think it's a case now of English football just doing this terrible thing that no one else is doing it seems to be all of european football is trying to do it and it's pretty much on how safe it can be if they can find a way to do it safely then i, I don't see a real problem with it in terms of if it's carefully managed i think it's going to be safer than you know probably going to your local supermarket and things like that um, and obviously as i always say as well Football clubs are businesses, just like shops are businesses or companies that are trying to get back to having some kind of income coming in. Football clubs are no different. I think if they don't get back to playing football, you're going to see a hell of a lot of clubs going out of business. Um, so like I say, I understand the safety fears, but I think that's, if anything, they're trying to make it almost like the perfect scientific environment to play football in, as it were. Um, Mitchell Loder asks, could you see Spurs swapping Carl Walker-Peters for Hoiberg? Yeah, I could actually. Um, as I've said before, I think this is one of these markets where you're going to see a lot of swap deals. Um, and I think much of it depends on Carl Walker-Peters. I get the sense Hoiberg, especially with the comments he's come out recently, would like that step up. You know, he was at Bayern Munich and it didn't quite work out for him. I think he'd maybe got some unfinished business there. Um, but now it's down to Carl Walker-Peters really to, he, you know, I think he started maybe just the one match before football was shut down for Saints. So it's up to him now to prove to them that he's worthy of having on a permanent basis. Um, and if that's the case, I think Spurs would certainly look to include him in any deal. And like we say, Hoiberg's only got a year left in his deal. So we're not talking mega money. Um, and then you might be looking at probably not quite an equal trade, but certainly a player that Spurs could, um, could use for a fair whack of the fee. George Waynes asked, do you think João Sacramento could be Tottenham's next manager after Jose Mourinho? Funny enough, I wrote an article on this only yesterday. It was because they start to blend together slightly, don't they? Um, maybe, maybe. Um, it, it's really interesting. I, you know, I'd advise you to probably go and have a look at the article, but it's he's a very, very clever guy, very young. You know, he's only 31. There's a hell of a lot of similarities with Jose Mourinho and the the way he came into football, the educational side, rather than being a, a player, he was only, yeah, I say only, he was an academy player at Braga, but that was kind of the highest level he went to. And then very much it's been about the analysis side of the game for him. He's a very, very clever guy. Um, you know, he dreams of being a manager. He was Lille's caretaker manager for seven games. Um, and the points he got in the games that he won and drew helped essentially keep them in Ligue 1. Um, that season you know played its part so I'd imagine he'll want to go back to that as Tottenham's next manager let's see how it goes first you know there's a lot of uh, water to pass under the bridge first uh Ra Ra Raul sorry pronunciation is terrible as anyone knows that's seen these before Raul Gian Giannacaro I'm sorry if I've absolutely murdered the pronunciation of your name there 
are we still interested in Nathan Ferguson as he's free? Um, he's a funny one. He was he was a lot at the time was kind of heard of Nathan Ferguson pretty much in the first half of the season. Uh, him and Max Ahrens, Spurs kind of watched them both. Palace obviously coming in very strongly for Nathan Ferguson, and it all went a little bit wrong for him with his knee injury, failed medical. Um, I think he's still recovering from that knee injury. Did he have exploratory surgery, I think, on it? Um, certainly, I'd imagine, personally, it would be someone that Spurs would look at. You know, he's only, I think he's probably 19, if he's not 20 yet. Um, he can play on the right, he can play on the left. He can also tuck in as another centre-back, a bit like Jaffet Tanganga. Um, so you'd kind of be mad not to look at He's not technically free. When we say free with players of that age, there'll be a tribunal fee, which will be more if he stays in the Premier League. He's indicated a preference to stay in the Premier League, although I think clubs in Germany have been looking at him as well. Um, I think I'd be surprised if they don't have a look. I just feel like Palace maybe are still in the driving seat for him um, when that uh, contract eventually ends. House of Zoltar asks, I think that's a big reference, isn't it? Uh, do you think we need more pacey wingers and fullbacks? Ben Davies doesn't inspire confidence against quicker opponents. Um, I don't think they need more pacey wingers. You know, you've got Bergvine, Son, Lucas, um, Ryan Sessegnon. I, I don't think pace is an issue down either side now in the wings. Fullbacks, Aurier's no slouch. Um, Sessegnon, if the long term ambition is to make him a left back, I don't think is. is He's pretty rapid as well. Um, yeah, I don't know. And I think it'd be maybe a bit harsh on Ben Davies. I think he gets a rough deal. I think he's a really good squad player. Um, he had a great year when Danny Rose got injured. And one thing I'd say about him, I remember watching him against Adam, Adam Traore when, when he played for Middlesbrough. He was superb against him. Um, he was really, really good. He kind of handled his his pace. I think the last time Spurs played Traore, obviously Wolves, I think Vertonghen was at left-back and struggled a bit. So now I think that's a little bit harsh on Davies. I think we all remember the Sadio Mane game, Liverpool match, where Davies had a real tough time. But let's be honest, most players have a difficult day with Sadio Mane. He is superb. Um, now, I'd probably say that that's one thing they're maybe not desperate for. I mean, if they do get Max Ahrens, that's another... He's no slow player either. Um, I wouldn't say it's a massive priority. Jordan Hussain asks, our four under, under Mourinho was shocking. What do you think um, he will do differently when the players return? I think for him it will be key to have this kind of mini pre-season. Um, he hasn't had a lot of time to work with the players. We know that. You know, It's not been ideal. He had matches galore in the, um, in the early months after he came in November. And I don't think he really had any time to set an imprint. I think he was just trying to react to what had gone before and just kind of jolt the team back to life. It didn't feel like a set pattern of play. And I think that's down to him and Sacramento now over these coming weeks and also for the next season to do that. Um, I think it'll be a bit of a blend of what you've been used to, Mourinho. Um, the count, probably more direct, less possession play, but also Sacramento comes with a bit of a a reputation for pressing football, a little bit like Pochettino's. And uh, Mourinho said, I, remember, I think it was his opening press conference, he said, I'm not going to change too much because these players are used to playing in a certain way. I'm just going to tweak it and change, I think it was called the principles of play, he said. Um, I'm aware I'm already racking up the time on this, so I'm going to start rattling through it. So sorry if I don't give you a, a full answer that you desperately wanted for it, but I'll try my best. Uh, Michael McCarthy asks, why is it when we have a good team, it never lasts? Cycles. It's all about uh, cycles in football. It's a very secular uh, sport, and teams have their eras, and then they, you know, they're gone. Um, with Tottenham, you know, I think I've said before that they didn't push on during those two years. They properly challenged Leicester and Chelsea for the title. Just a, a signing then in that 2018, I think, would have pushed them to being closer, and they just never really pushed on. And um, let's see what Mourinho does, but I think. You know, I think that was probably a really, really good chance to then kick on. Um, Dean Cox asks, with finances tight and a need for another striker, why aren't we going for Dreves Martin, Mertens? Um, <clears throat> pretty much from everything I understand about him, the Belgian, he wants to stay in Italy. Um, he was linked with Inter, but I think Napoli are actually going to try and keep him now. Seems to be the latest thing. Um, so, yeah, I think Spurs have really been in the market. He was one they used to look at when he was in his uh, probably mid-twenties. I remember them kind of being really heavily linked with him, but 
Yeah, it doesn't seem to be a player that's right high up on their radar. Um, Adrian Lalia asks, we need funds. Who do you think will leave this summer? Oh, we're flipping it around the other way. Um, I'd say if there's no guarantees of first team football coming or minutes, I think Juan Foyt will be on his way. I think he's would be a shame for me. Um, people probably know my thoughts on Juan Foyth. I think there's a lot of potential there. He just needs to get the silly, youthful mistakes out of his system. Um, but with that potential comes a bit of a price tag. So I think Spurs can bring in funds for him. I think Jan Vertonghen, there seems to be so many links to Italy at the moment. Um, and it doesn't seem to be any indication of Spurs actually offering him a, a deal past the extension of this season. I'm sure they'll look to tie him down for the rest of the season. But yeah, I think uh, I think unfortunately we might see Big Yan going, Super Yan, which would be a, a shame. I think there's more for him to give. I don't think he's finished as a, a top flight player at all. Um, I don't think he's going to be at the same level he also always was. But, you know, I still think for his experience, it would be a shame to lose him. But I can maybe see him, you know, heading back to Ajax. I think that's a dream for him. Maybe not this season, but maybe in a year or two's time. Um, so that's Foyth, um, Vertonga, and I think you'll see players that have been loaned out, like Walker Peters, Rose, Carter Vickers. May, probably the, uh, the club will look to try and get some kind of fee. But as I said, with the financial issues, that affects buying clubs as well, not only the, you know, the, the sellers as well. So what you're going to get, hopefully it will be a relative if price tags do come down. Um, and as I've said before, again, another one that pains me, but I think if he's going to look to... Bring in the likes of a William on a free, <coughs> excuse me, on a free transfer. Then maybe you look, unfortunately, due to his injury record, to someone like Eric Lamella, who would still be very much wanted in Italy, and you could get good money for. But like I say, I'd be disappointed at that because I do, do think if he can get a run of games together, he can be such a such a an addition, a bonus to Spurs when they're on the pitch. He pretty much always contributes something. Um, what else we got here? Let's have a look. Thomas Mesher asks, do you think Vidat Mariki is our most likely striker transfer? Everything I've heard um, on this guy is that there's nothing really in those reports. Um, sorry to kind of take that off your list, Thomas, but yeah, unfortunately, it just doesn't seem to actually be in that. And I've heard that from a couple of places as well, um, inside Spurs and Mourinho's camp as well. So I can't see that one really being a goer. Sometimes this happens. Agent links. Um, sometimes just players just get linked with, with clubs. And there's, maybe there was a, a conversation a while back. Maybe a scout was at a game. You know, anything can kind of produce these. Alex Stiliano asks, how do you see us fitting Ondembele, Lo Celso and Ali into the same team? I was thinking exactly the same thing a couple of days ago. And it is a toughie. Uh, it really is. I mean, you know, Tongi Ondembele... Can be actually all three of them. They're all game changers. They absolutely are. Um, sadly, I think it's a real struggle to do so because I think to get the best out of Ondombele and Celso together, you play them in the midfield three with a Winks or a defensive midfielder. You know, maybe Skip in a year or two's time um, playing behind them, and then unfortunately that then allows you. You're going to have a three up front, aren't you, with um, Kane and you're likely probably going to have Bergvine and Son either side of him, which leaves no room for Ali. I do feel that Mourinho rates Ali so highly, and I think he's such an underrated player. I think he goes through he's, you know the last 12 months, maybe 18, he's had a dip in his form, yet his numbers are still astonishing for a player his age. You know, what is he, 22 maybe? Is he even 23? I don't know. I'd have to look at that, but... I just feel you've still got to work a way of getting him in his team. And I do wonder whether that's what he'll do. He'll, he'll find a system to try and fit them all. Um, when I say all, I mean Ali in there with Bergwijn and Son. So I do feel that most matches you're going to probably be missing an Ali or an Ondemel. I think Lo Celso is probably the one who's now the most guaranteed of a spot. Um, and then it's down on Ondembele to probably prove himself and Ali... I mean, Ali, obviously, you could play in one of the right or left positions off Kane. I still feel that you get the most out of a behind him. He probably suits a, a 4-2-3-1 better. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's a great question. And I think that's that's one that I can't answer. And I think Mourinho is the one who's going to have to. Um, I might try and put that to him, actually, when when all things are firing and back on uh, teams are playing again. Richard Lees asked, do you think the lack of huge transfer deals 
will benefit Spurs if they're going to have a season out of the Champions League in terms of not losing players like Son and Kane. Uh, yeah, I can see the logic behind that. I can definitely see that. Um, I think Spurs won't drop are unlikely to drop their price tags for players. They're not that kind of club. So, yeah, I think it probably does work. I, th I think, it, you know, I just hate to repeat myself because I can just hear people just probably going, oh, shut up and move on. But I think there's been so many people coming out and saying chairmen's, um, uh, man so chairmen, not chairmen's, chairmen, um, players, and I think pretty much... Some of the pundits, you just get these mixed views where I saw something today about Teddy Sheringham saying that Harry Kane should um, should move on. It's like, you've got to have a grasp of the financial market this year is just not going to involve £150 million deals for players like Harry Kane. It's just not. It's just not there. You know, Barcelona have come out and said stuff like that. United have come out and said like that. It's just not happening. Any player who's got years left in his contract is just going to have to wait if they want to move. Um, so, yeah. In answer, yes to your question. I think it will benefit them. Chad Mercer asks, if Poch goes to Newcastle, do you believe he'll be successful there? And will he be greeted warmly by Spurs fans? Um, yeah, I think Pochettino would do well there. I do. Um, I think it would probably be an element of sadness to see him go there and, and do something. I think he'd be a little bit of a kind of a shot in the, shot in the arm Bobby Robson type for Newcastle um, I think it'd be interesting to see what he did especially if he's allowed to have a bit of money um, because that was always my one of my question marks against Pochettino was how many of his signings in his tenure I know you could argue whether he signed players or didn't but I always was told he had the final say over them anyway um, how much of a you know a transfer record he'd have with money um, so that would be interesting to see but I think he'll have learned a lot as well from his time at Tottenham. And he's still young. You know, the guy's, was he 46, I think? I'm terrible at guessing ages today. Um, I think he can only get better. Um, and I think that's something to keep an eye on with him because I think I think he will just go a higher and higher and higher. And, uh, you know, I got to see a lot and got to kind of see a lot behind the scenes, how he worked as well. And he's a talented guy. And Spurs fan greeting him warmly, yeah. I don't see why you wouldn't. Um, I know there's this thing like some people seem to be quite divided in that you can't praise Mourinho without having a go at Poch. And it seems to be these kind of two camps. Just appreciate good managers, you know. Mourinho's done a hell of a lot in his career. Pochettino, I think, is going to go on and do a hell of a lot. And I think he's he's achieved a lot in terms of everything you can do up to the point of silverware for him it's now just that's the next step for him um 1985-02 asks if liverpool aren't extending one alden's contract should we go all out for him um i think the latest out of liverpool seems to be that they are going to extend his contract and i think if he were to be a, were to be available i think there'd be a hell of a lot of competition for him um i don't think it would just be spurs going for him I'd imagine that would be one Spurs would maybe be priced out of. Uh, good player, though. I agree. TB, what are your expectations for Spurs' first full season under Jose Mourinho? Um, well, he's put the pressure on. He said uh, Spurs will challenge for the title, and he said it again a couple of weeks ago, so unaffected by anything else. Um, what I would say is that everywhere he's been, when he's had that first full season or... Maybe you could argue the second season. When he's had that second season to really get a Mourinho stamp on the team, his teams have kind of pretty much done almost everything he's asked of them. You know, United, I'm trying to think the second season. Second season, was that the... Or was it the first season the um, we picked up um, Europa League and one of the domestic cups that's gone out of my head? So I think Spurs will win a trophy. I do. I think he'll go all out for one of the domestic cups, probably, you know, in order, you know, try and get that league cup under his belt just to say, right, get over that hurdle. You've done it. Now let's focus on actually, you know, this is the irony, isn't it? Is that I think Pochettino always said, look, it won't make a difference to it winning those trophies. It's all about the Premier League and Champions League to make this club a bigger club. And I understood where he was coming from. But I always felt, and it's been Mourinho's philosophy for years, if you win that first trophy, whatever it is, 
you start that winning mentality and the players then, and especially at Tottenham, this real monkey on their back it's been, hasn't it? If you get that off their back, then suddenly they're free to focus and not have in the back of their mind that they're going to choke again in a trophy winning situation. Um, so yeah, I think he'll win a domestic trophy and I think he'll push Spurs back up into, well, I say top four, they technically could still get it when football, if football resumes properly. Um, but I think... I think he'll push them top three. I do. I do. I think there's still the other clubs aren't consistent enough. And I think with Mourinho's background, he should be able to do it. Um, yeah. So what else we got here? Mr. V Movie Reviews asks, do you think Pochettino returned to Spurs after Mourinho? Um Probably not. Probably not directly after. Um, but, you know, he said himself he wants to come back. Unfinished business at Tottenham. I'd say maybe five, six, seven years' time. You know, like I said, he's only in his mid to late 40s. A hell of a long managerial career ahead of him. Um, he's got plenty of time to do that. Uh, the SJD001 asks, which strikers do you think would be best suited as Spurs signings? Oh, this is where I'm going to make people unhappy. Because um, my view on the perfect strikers for Spurs are probably not the ideal dream scenario strikers that I'd imagine lots of people want. Because for me, I kind of, I suppose, maybe I'm looking at it as more of a, um, try and look at it an objective point of view, and I look at it as the financial situation has to play a part as well. And I do still believe that this striker position while I totally just don't understand why Spurs were unable to buy a striker this season, especially last summer, I do see how it's a tough gig to sell to someone unless you can get the right profile of player. You know, these some of the names that I see, you know, massive star names, um, you know, Haaland from Dortmund, I still see people saying it's like the guy is going to have to regularly start. That That's not a player that's going to come in to share time with... Harry Kane or, um, you know, or potentially take minutes here and there. You know, that kind of player is going to be put off by Harry Kane. They just are. You know, I know people don't like that argument, but it is true. And Spurs, I certainly know, you know, Pochettino has told us of players in the past that have said no because of Harry Kane. Um, but I do believe that when you look at the older big target men strikers that I think would also fit a Mourinho mould and would come in and do a job alongside Kane, which I think Lorente was actually starting to get towards doing, which kind of, for me, made it a bit... It was a bit mad that they'd... I know they didn't really want to pay him, that they offered him half of his contract um, price, uh, which was why he, he didn't take it and went to Napoli. You know, it was left on the table for him. But I think you need that big man. So for me, Olivier Giroud, he's not a big goal scorer, but I can see how he fits that role. Um, in a slightly different vein. The other way you could go is to have a player who can play up front but can also play out wide. So you're looking at Josh King. If a Bournemouth can do that, his injury concern is maybe the one thing about him. You know, I, I've, I've seen links with um, Lille's Victor Omishin. I can never pronounce that one either. But, you know, some of the figures I've seen for him is between anywhere between 70 and 95 million. As I said, Spurs don't have the money for that. Um, so when you're being realistic, I think this kind of big striker type who can play as a backup, brings experience. I think Giroud ticks a lot of boxes. Um, King does as well, because if you're versatile, you're going to play more minutes in other positions as well. Zayzuba, uh, another one of absolutely having a pronunciation nightmare today. Um, he plays for Zenit St. Petersburg. He's available on a free transfer. He's someone that Spurs looked at. I think if you look at a lot of the January signings they tried to make, they were big strikers. You know, William Jose. Um, they looked at Slimani briefly as well. I think even Benteke was considered. Um, big. These are big target man strikers. Someone as a foil for Kane to take that battering ram job off of him. Um, so anyone like that. But like I said, I think Giroud for me just ticks a lot of boxes and knows the Premier League inside out. Against Spurs at Stamford Bridge, he was sensational, to be honest. And if he could play like that for Spurs, I think it'd be fantastic. But if I was Chelsea, would I sell him to Spurs? That's another thing. Um, Jeff Stevens asked, do you think Leighton Orient will be singing he's one of our own about Harry Kane after his gesture? I wouldn't be surprised. I thought it was magnificent. I thought it really was. Um, it'd be interesting to see when they play. Kane says he won't treat it any differently. 
But I just thought it was such a brilliant gesture to what his first ever league uh, loan club. And yeah, um, I hope they do because, you know, footballers, it's, it's, it's unprecedented, isn't it? You know, I know we've heard that word a lot in recent months, but for footballers to do that, footballers to go out and essentially save a club financially, really, through that shirt deal while promoting three charities, you know, what a guy. It was superb. Uh, JR last scene says, asked, do you think signing Ryan Fraser would be a good addition? Yeah, a few people have asked me about Ryan Fraser. He's a good player. He is a good player. I probably wouldn't say he's a sensational player, but he's a good player and he's young. 26, I think he is. Free transfer. You know, it, it's a kind of a no-brainer from that aspect. But there is also a side of me that kind of thinks, do Spurs need him? Is he in an area they need? Are there other priorities? Or, like I've said with Lamella type, you know, a Lamella kind of deal, do you bring in a free transfer and then sell a player to make funds for one of those priority areas? <sighs> I, I think he's a player that Spurs have looked at in the past. They, they like a, quite a few Bournemouth players. I know they looked at David Brooks really carefully. I think that was a mistake to, to not get in when Bournemouth came in for him. Nathan Ake is another one they've looked at. And as I say, Josh King's someone they've looked at over the years as well. So he certainly is on their radar. But I think there'll be other clubs in for him and I think they'll offer big money. And like I say, I just can't see if he's a priority. Um, Lebone Menakiki. <laughs> Sorry, that's terrible again. Do you think it would be wise to consider Declan Rice? Um, is it realistic? And if not, will Skip, could Skip play in the defensive midfield role? Uh, Declan Rice would probably say isn't realistic. Um, Spurs and West Ham... There's not the greatest of um, relationships there. When it comes to doing transfers, I can't really see in the seasons to come. I think there were some uh, crosswords, over, certainly over the whole stadium issues and you know moving to the London Stadium at the time. And I don't think they're the best of friends. Um, so I probably would be surprised at that one, to be honest. And even more recently, they got Jedson Fernandez as a player that West Ham have been desperately trying to get. It's all these little things. I can't see that. Skip, um, I'd be surprised if Mourinho isn't looking at trying to mould him in that way. He's a very all-round player, can play box-to-box, -box, but I think he's tactically very clever. Uh, what I've seen of him, you know, saw a lot of him in the under-23s and under-19 European football and, and FA Youth Cup matches. He's, he's a player that can certainly be moulded into what you want as a midfielder. Um, and Mourinho's already said he likes him and he's got a big future. So, yeah, well, I wouldn't rule that out. I think, I think that's probably a good shout. Harry Mace asked, do you think one of our biggest failures in recent years could be player sales? 100%, Harry. 100%. Honestly, you do wonder if the biggest example is Christian Eriksen. If you'd let Eriksen go for a, a reasonable fee at the start of last summer and allowed Pochettino to get on with his rebuild... I think you probably would have seen a different end result to the Pochettino era. Um, and same with other ones, you know, uh, probably Rose could have gone earlier in his career. Um, I feel like there's someone really big that I'm not thinking of as well. I mean, there's been loads of players that have just stuck around the fringes like Janssen and Kudu, who, you know, you just, just they should have just, no offence to them, but just should have got shot for them for, for the lesser money. Um, and... Just to, just to get them off the books, just to create funds for other players. Yeah, 100% agree. I really feel like I'm missing out on someone in that, but it will, maybe it will come to me. Charlie THFC asks, could we see a transfer window with no signings like 2018? Despite everything I'm saying about finances, I don't think so. I think there will be because Mourinho needs them. Um, he said so many times last season uh, towards the end, uh, sorry, this season, uh, that he wants, whatever happens, he wants a more balanced squad with Tottenham next season. We know that refers to strikers. If Carl Walker-Peters doesn't come back, it's going to be a right back. There's no defensive midfielder, really. Um, you know, I think I think they have to make them, and I think they obviously won't be, as I've said, big, big money signings, but I think there will have to be signings. No new manager can come in and then only have two January signings as his stamping his imprint on a team. It just doesn't work like that. Um... Oh, the last question. Uh, number 25, Sven524 asks, who's your all-time favourite player and why? Mine is Steve Perryman. Steve Perryman is a proper legend. I've been very fortunate enough to interview him 
quite a few times now. A lovely guy, really, really adores Tottenham Hotspur and obviously, you know, the record appearance holder for Tottenham. Um, my football favourite footballers when I was a kid were Gary Lineker at first. He was, I was, you know, I was a striker in my playing days. I say playing days, obviously he's never hit the heights, but Gary Lineker for me was an absolute hero. And then after him was Teddy Sheringham. Um, those two for me were probably, you know, there's players I love to watch over the years at Spurs, Gascoigne, and kind of as old as I probably look. I didn't really catch too much of Hoddle other than on my, when, as I've referred to before, Greasy's Six of the Best video that my dad got me when I was a kid that had some of Hoddle's great moments in the early 80s. Um, but Gaza certainly loved watching Ginola, Van der Vaart, uh, Modric, Berbatov, players like that as we went on. Outside Spurs, Cantona was class. That's probably one of my favourite goals. Is that one? Um, I forgot who it was against. Was it Sunderland? Um, the, the chip where he just turns away with that kind of look on his face. That was just is up there with my favourite goals. Um, but yeah, probably Lineker and Sheringham, the two from my childhood that will always kind of stick with me. Um, yeah, I was just trying to think if there's anyone I missed, but no, it's those two really. So there you go. We've got to the end of the 25. Um, we're still kind of waiting to hear just as I'm. Um, finishing this video on whether the players and the captains and the managers have decided on whether they're going to go back to contact training. Um, I think it's going to be quite a surprise if they don't. The government have said it can happen, so we could be seeing that towards the end of this week. Certainly the players, certainly Spurs players, everyone seems to have come back. There don't seem to have been any objections. Um, I haven't seen Winks and Session on until yesterday, but they certainly seem to be involved. Um, and then we'll see where we go from there. As I've said before, it's all about the testing and the results. You know, it's really key to see what's happening with the Bundesliga. You know, we've got another round of midweek matches uh, tonight, and seeing how whether they're getting cases after matches. And it currently doesn't seem to be the case. I know there's that Bundesliga two side, but in terms of the top flight, they seem to be managing it. And certainly, I know we had six in the first week with the Premier League and two in the last one. Um, if they can keep on top of that and manage it, um, then we'll get our football back, which is great. I know it's not the same. I know the fans not being in the stadiums is is weird. You know, I've been watching the Bundesliga games and, and they are strange. But what I would say is the quality isn't affected. The quality of the matches and the goals has been fantastic. It's a strange atmosphere. And as naff as it sounds, I do think playing a bit of crowd noise, as much as I hate that, in when they do it actually at matches with fans there I do kind of think from a television viewing point of view it actually might work um, I don't think it'll probably have much impact on the players but in terms of viewing it from home I think it might um, as naff as it sounds and I know it sounds naff even as I'm saying it but I just think it might be just the one missing element that it, that it is because uh, the fans are everything they really are um, and I just hope that we get to a situation we get some kind of treatment or something in the the weeks and months ahead more likely months unfortunately um where we can all get back to football matches um and football as we know it because it's pretty great isn't it football when uh when, when we have it there and you know how much you miss it when it's not there so that's the 25 questions hopefully answers were, were good enough for you and like i say as always ask your questions underneath this in the comments and i'll do my best on the next time uh, to do another q a and uh, as always, stay safe, look after yourselves, and uh, I shall talk to you later. Bye.